Aloha, and welcome back to the sixth episode of Talk Story with House Majority. My name is Della Albilotti, and I serve as the House Majority Leader for the State of Hawaii's 30th Legislature. To our viewers, thank you so much for joining us each week. We are really busy here at the State Legislature and will be reconvening next Monday, June 22nd. Talk Story with House Majority will be moving to 8.30 a.m. on Wednesdays until our last episode on July 15th. Here in Hawaii, we are at the yellow level of act with care. Inter-island travel without the 14-day quarantine has been lifted for residents. Our Kama'aina economy is gradually reopening. Key to that reopening will be the ability for working families to have childcare options, especially for our youngest keiki. This pandemic has revealed that many, many parents are essential workers and the need for childcare has remained a steady concern throughout this pandemic. Today, I'm so lucky to be joined by Catherine Betts, the Deputy Director for the State Department of Human Services, who has been working to address the issue of childcare prior to and throughout the past few months. And later, I'll be talking story with Representatives Linda Ichiyama and Representative Troy Hashimoto about how the pandemic has impacted childcare and essential workers in their communities, both here on Oahu and on Maui. Be sure to comment questions for our guest on the live stream featured on facebook.com backslash Alelo community. So here with me today, and I'm so, so excited to be able to introduce DHS Deputy Director Kathy Betts. Kathy has been on the job as Deputy Director for almost three years. Um, Kathy formerly led the Hawaii State Commission on the Status of Women as its executive director for six years. She has always, always been a strong advocate for women and their families for as long as I have known her. So quick disclosure here, Kathy and I are both alumni from UH Manoa Law School. Uh, Kathy, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but you were the second Patsy T. Mink Legislative Fellow from the law school in 2004 who worked for Senator Daniel K. Inouye, correct? Uh, correct? Kathy, are you there? I am. Thank you so much for joining us. I know how much you and the team, really the team at Department of Human Services has done so much for our keiki, for our families, for individuals who are suffering from unemployment, underemployment, and who really just need assistance. Our theme today is to focus on childcare. So people don't realize that early childcare operations never shut down and that there was an immediate need for childcare even when we went uh, into uh, shelter in place orders. How many of these types of facilities stayed open from your estimation? Um, that's a great question. You know, over 250 childcare centers and homes across the state stayed open, which is about 30% of our regulated childcare providers in the state. Um, many of the centers experienced challenges during this time, and so when we were reviewing guidance and ways to reopen child care, uh, we didn't take those challenges lightly, and we we um, considered all of the different ramifications throughout our state in terms of child care and providers. So, you know, this pandemic is evolving. We've had to take immediate measures. We're looking at short-term measures, and we're looking at long-term fixes and, and solutions. Let, let's, let's focus in on the immediate stuff. As the state shut down, what were some of the immediate measures taken by the Department of Human Services to support early child care providers? What, what did uh, DHS do to support the child care facilities? Well, we knew that uh, we knew that there were going to be a lot of changes and uh, despair in the community. So we engaged in a number of modifications and waivers early on. Uh, initially, we extended the preschool open doors application deadline to ensure that interested families could still apply if their incomes had gone down um, and they might qualify or if they wanted to update application information to account for any decrease in their family's income. So that was one such uh, modification that we made to our, um, to our systems. Uh, another Another waiver that we applied was the monthly gross income eligibility requirements for families to apply for the Child Care Connection Hawaii, which is one of our subsidy programs. Uh, we also waived activity requirements to assist families who had lost jobs and were looking for new employment or had their hours at work reduced significantly. And we waived subsidy co-pays for families who may have had a co-pay on a sliding scale for Child Care Connection Hawaii. So we engaged in a lot of different modifications quickly um, we had to be nimble. We had to move quickly because we knew that 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 families were struggling and that child care, you know, child care is essential. It's the backbone of our economy. Um, majority of our, our families in Hawaii are working families, multi-gen families. So we we absolutely understand the need for for essential child care in the community. Um, the last thing that we did was we waived 
any state or federal emergency benefits like UI or pandemic UI from being countable income for child care subsidy purposes. So, for example, families who received any of these payments would not have those funds considered uh, for, for income in terms of eligibility. Um, well, so that's quite a bit. You know, I, I think people don't realize that there is assistance out there. So let's you, you talked about two programs. Can you describe the Child Care Connection Hawaii subsidies program? Who, who qualifies that qualifies for that? Um, so the, the Child Care Connection Hawaii subsidy program helps low income families to sustain their employment, educational efforts and job training by paying a subsidy for their children who are in the care of a DHS approved child care provider. Uh, but as mentioned before, when the pandemic started with these activity requirements were waived during this time and eligible children range from newborn up to 12 years old. So we waived a lot of the different activity requirements and, um, and income requirements. So we urge any family who believes they might be able to qualify for these subsidies to apply online at our website, which is humanservices.hawaii.gov. Okay, so that's one one program for newborns up to, up through 12 years old. There's the preschool open doors program. What can parents expect from this assistance program? Correct. So uh, this is a separate subsidy program that provides services statewide to families sending their children to a licensed preschool during the year prior to kindergarten entry. And the goal of POD is really to promote school readiness for children. And the program focuses on meeting the needs of the child. So the child must be age eligible, ed eligible meaning they're about to uh, enter into kindergarten the following year. Um, and this has been a great program. What we did with Preschool Open Doors is we uh, waived the application deadline, extended it to, um, I believe it was May 15th, to allow other families to, to apply if they thought they might be eligible. And I want to emphasize again, both of these programs, if parents have experienced job loss or reduction in hours, um, if they hadn't uh, um, been eligible before, they might be eligible now. So they really should check out your website, correct? Absolutely. So if you go to humanservices.hawaii.gov, there's a yellow banner right in the middle of the page that says child care guidance. And you can click on that and it has a lot of different information. It also has information about what we're doing with our 11.9 million in federal funds. So that is, um, you know, nearly 12 million in federal funds that will help to support regulated child care providers in modifying their operations in response to COVID-19. Um, and so those uh, child care providers who believe that they're eligible can submit an application to their licensing office to see if they're eligible for some of these funds. Um, and the deadline for that application is July 31st. Wow. So there's a lot of assistance out there. And I know we're going to talk with this uh, with my colleagues later on, but there's also assistance from um, the counties. So so parents really should reach out, look look at what's on the DHSH website and really just ask and inquire um, because because there is assistance. Um, I want to move now shifting from the eligibility of programs. You know, parents are concerned. Will child care facilities even open up? What can they expect uh, for the for the new school year, for those of who are in those kind of licensed, more academic, early child care programs that you folks um, oversee, um, can you provide any insights into what parents can expect, and the uh, and the early child care community? We did. We worked quickly with the economic navigator and representative Linda Ichiyama and a working group of child care providers to look at what type of guidance we needed to be providing to the providers in the community, whether it's an academic institution or a child care provider early uh, childhood education. Um, and so what we did, we surveyed these providers in the working group, and I, I know that Rep. Chiyama can share more later on during her session, but we needed to figure out, you know, we're in a, we're in a quickly evolving situation, right? So as cases go up, um, confirmed cases go up, we're going to have to pare down a little bit. And so we took that into account initially when we started rolling out the guidance. So the ratios that we first provided uh, via our, our guidance for child care providers was um, a lot smaller. So it was nine children to one provider. Um, we, we revisited that with Department of Health and reviewed CDC and WHO guidance, also worked with Rep Ichiyama and the Economic Navig Navigator to um, change those ratios back to the original uh, DHS administratively approved ratios. And so um, what I would urge parents to understand is to be patient as we navigate through this public health emergency. Um, and we can expect that the guidance may shift or change or be modified. 
but we are continuing to assist and stand by for child care providers in the community. Um, we urge folks to work with their licensing, their licensing workers um, to figure out what, um, how the guidance fits for them. I, I want to just kind of underscore what you said, because I think it's really important and it's, it's for any family with any um, child, whether they're newborns uh, all the way up through 12th grade, right, um, in any of these educational or care settings, because we're in this pandemic, um, we may see situations where there might be spikes in the community, there might be a need for us to pull back a little bit. And that's exactly what you're saying, parents. We all have to be sort of flexible with this, but I, I really do appreciate that the department itself has also been flexible, you know, responding to that, that, that call to change up the ratio, because um, I think what we're seeing in other places, right, this notion of a bubble and keeping kids in bubbles, right, so that you can actually have more within the um, within your bubble and still be safe. And I think that's what parents really wanna know. So I really appreciate your the fo what you uh, folks have done with the guidance. Yeah, absolutely. And I know Dr. Park talks about the Ohana bubble um, and that's really, that's not just for contact tracing purposes, that's really to prevent any kind of cross-contamination or um, or spread in a, in a facility. So it's, it's keeping kids in a, in a little pod or cohort rather um, to prevent that from happening and to really know that your children are going to be safe in this, in this bubble. Obviously there are risks out there. There's always been risks and this pandemic is no different, um, but we are working quickly and we want the community to know that we are responding as quickly as possible. So I think I could have you on for like another half an hour Kathy, because I know that the Department of Human Services actually is, is providing a lot of assistance. So we might have to have you back on our show at some point, you know, to talk about um, uh, the SNAP program, because we know food, uh, food insecurity is also a huge problem in the community. Um, but I wanted to give you this last you know, two minutes um, for any final insights or lessons learned that you would want to share about early child care in Hawaii. Sure. Thank you again for having me. Stella, um, we know that the child care sector is essential for our continued economic recovery, and it's also um, essential for our children's stability and resiliency and being able to learn and grow in a safe environment. And as tragic as this health crisis has been, it's been able to uplift the absolute necessity of supporting working families, whether it's through increased federal access to leave for caregiving, to increased access to health resources, or to simply highlighting the importance of child care. We absolutely know that child care is a necessity and um, we hold it as uh, in its utmost importance for our families because it, it is, it's a necessity. Thank you again, Kathy, for joining us. I know you got to run off and I know you have your own cakey to take care of as well as all the cakey of the state. So thank oh. you so much for joining us. <laughs> thank you so much for having me. I appreciate the time. So as we're transitioning, I'm going to ask Alelo to flash up um, uh, a graphic up here. And I really want to make a plug. You know, some of the programs that we heard Kathy share with us, the fact that um, the state of Hawaii Department of Human Services um, received a $12 million grant on top of all of the other child care funding uh, that they have received from the federal government. I wanted to share with you, with everyone out there, that because of the 2020 census and all the past censuses we've done um, as a community every 10 years, uh, we get quite a bit in federal funds uh, to support so many important programs like childcare. So as you can see on this graphic, um, you know, in the year 2016, fiscal year 2016, we had over $7 million in one program, another $12 million, another $9 million, all coming to the state of Hawaii because we had people who were counted in the census. It's really important um, for all of you out there, if you have it, um, the 2020 census is in full swing and there is still time to fill out the form for you and your household to be counted. The census informs many things, including how federal money is allocated to the states. Um, please, please, please visit 2020census.gov to ensure you and your family are all counted. Uh, we really depend on all of these federal funds as we can see during this time of pandemic. So with that plug, I'd like to introduce and welcome my colleagues, Representative Ichiyama and Representative Hashimoto to continue our discussion on early childcare. Representative Ichiyama is a co-convener of the Women's Legislative Caucus. She's a veteran legislator, legislator from uh, the IAM Moana Lua Salt Lake area. Representative Troy Hashimoto is, I believe, in his third year here at the legislature. He is a wonderful, energetic, enthusiastic legislator 
from Maui, um, representing, um, representing, I believe, Central Maui, and I might be wrong, I'm so sorry, Representative Hashimoto, you can correct me. Um, both of these uh, representatives are so wonderful uh, to work with. Thank you for being here. Wanted to start off uh, with my questions. Um, first to Representative Hashimoto. What's been the experience of childcare on the island of Maui um, from the beginning of the state stay-at-home orders? Well, good afternoon, Della, and thanks so much for having me this, this afternoon. And, you know, I think child care is such a critical part of, you know, just our us operating as an island. And I think it's posed many challenges over the, the shutdown and, and the, since the reopening. And I think when, I, when I'm talking to a lot of the providers, of course, I think there was so much uncertainty that they decided to start doing a lot of services online. But obviously, that doesn't help a lot of the folks that need to continue working. So there was a few operators that continued throughout the pandemic. Uh, and, they, you know, of course, prioritizing essential workers. And I think they, they, they went through the process and they were lifelines for many of those individuals. But I think now as we begin to open up, we realize a lot more people are going to work. And I think when I talk to the providers, they are very, very grateful of the increase in the ratio of allowing more students and children to go to the, the child care centers because, uh, you know, I think they were looking at really how do they make their budget work. I think with lower ratios, they were going to have to raise prices for those who were attending. And I think that was a very difficult choice uh, because they knew it would have really huge impacts on the community. So I think now, I think, with the, the higher ratio, I think the county of Maui is also stepping in with additional mm -hmm. funding because they do understand that without the subsidy, it's going to be very difficult. Because even though the ratio has changed, what, I'm, what I am hearing is that a lot of folks will not go back to full capacity. They will still have a portion that they will service via online services. And of course, like, once again, they're going to prioritize essential workers. But, you know, if you do have child care at home, they do want to still continue to provide for some of those services. So, you know, I think Head Start on Maui, which is provided by Maui Economic Opportunity, they usually have about 20 per um, cohort. And they said what they want to do is they want to keep that 20 number, but about five will go kind of be serviced online. And then the 15 will be reserved for, of course, essential workers. It's really wonderful to hear that they're It's really wonderful to hear that um, the child care facilities are adapting with distance learning and, and a, a portion at home and, and a portion um, in, in person. I want to turn to uh, Representative Ichiyama now. Thank you so much, uh, Representative Hashimoto. Please hang on there. We're going to keep talking with you. Uh, Representative Ichiyama, from the beginning, you have had to deal with your own challenges with child care as a working mom. What has been particularly challenging as a mom with two very young children for you? Thank you so much for having me, Della. So I have two kids. Um, Dylan is three. Emily is about uh, 21 months, so a year and a half. Um, so the lockdown was tough. I'm not going to lie. Uh, being at home with two toddlers and not being able to leave your house, oh. things, things got interesting. Got interesting. <laughs> and then what happened was as we started to return um, to work, my husband was an essential worker as well. And then we came back for session in May, I had to find childcare. And so fortunately, Patch, which is the referral service for the state of Hawaii, had a list of providers that were open and that could provide temporary slots because our preschool wasn't reopened yet. So that's where we were able to put them temporarily while we're waiting for their school to reopen, which, I mean, I could not have been back in session in May without, without having childcare. Your experience is so common, and I, I have older children who can kind of be latchkey kids, yikes, at times, um, one's older, but yeah, the, it's really challenging. So, Linda, you know, you were tapped to work as the house liaison with Alan Oshima, the state's economic recovery navigator on the issue of child care. Um, from, from that vantage point, what has been the top two or three challenges for child care providers during this period? When I first started working with um, uh, the Navigator's Office and Department of Human Services back in April, the number one issue was the lack of guidance, right? Providers just didn't know how they could reopen, what it should look like. You had completing, competing and conflicting um, guidance from the city and county of Honolulu versus the state of Hawaii. So we worked quickly with Department of Human Services 
like Kathy mentioned, as well as with a small working group of providers who are on the ground and can tell us what could work, what would not work. And that's when we rolled out the first version of the child care guidelines. And after we did, the number one issue that we heard from providers was the small ratios, which at the time we were basing on CDC guidance of 10 groups of 10 or less. So we heard that feedback loud and clear and Department of Human Services was able to work with uh, Dr. Park and Department of uh, Health and as well as HIEMA to go back to the original ratio sizes as of just, just last week. Um, so now that has taken a lot of pressure off of childcare providers, but we're still hearing concerns about the need to clean and sanitize and disinfect. I was just on the phone with a, a multi-site uh, provider. They have 22 sites statewide. They've had to hire additional people to literally follow a group of kids around all day and plate their lunches and clean their toys and wipe down all the high-touch surfaces. It's very labor-intensive. So I want to acknowledge a question that came into our Facebook feed um, from Alan Smithy. And Alan has been with us, I think, for every episode. This, so thank you, Alan. Um, his question is, what do you expect to accomplish when the session resumes um, on June 22nd? And I'm going to modify that a little bit. What do you expect to accomplish with respect to early child care or hope to accomplish with early child care when we resume in June? Do you want me to take that or try I'll throw that to uh, Rep. Ichiyama first and then Rep. Rep. Hashimoto. So I think what we're looking at primarily is how do we allocate the state share, which is about $650 million in the CARES coronavirus relief funds. When we reconvened in May, the neighbor island counties received their portion and, of course, City and County of Honolulu got their share directly. So they've been able to roll out that funding. So now when we come back, we're looking at how can we support the child care industries as well as all of our other sectors that have been hurting with this coronavirus relief funds. Um, and I would put a plug in there. Like one of the things like you mentioned earlier was PPE and sanitation, like clearly that's a huge need that small businesses like these child care facilities are going to have to think long term. How are they going to source it? But, you know, that's perhaps an arena where we could do some some work. Right. Exactly. And I think that's the same challenge that any restaurant, small business, nonprofit is facing. Right. Where do you find hand sanitizer or Clorox wipes? Right. That's mm -hmm. the challenge across all different sectors. Rep Hashimoto, any thoughts on what you would like to see maybe accomplished? Um, and, and I'll open this one up um, on child care or on anything um, as we move into uh, June 22nd. No, I think Rep Ichiyama is absolutely correct that, you know, figuring out how we spend this CARES funding is going to be a top priority. I think what we're going to have to really get a clear picture on is how does our CARES funding that the state directly received how does that overlap with other federal funds that are going directly to a lot of these entities? Uh, because I think there is a lot of CARES funds out there, which is a good thing. But I think what the public is, and, and I think everyday folks who are having to face child care issues, they're kind of hurting. You know, I think it's, it's, it's a very difficult issue because they need to find providers. Providers are very cautious. They are very kind of not sure on you know, what they need. So I think costs are a big issue and we're going to have to figure out how to subsidize that in a meaningful way, because if we're really going to get this economy going, that has to be our number one priority. So we're going to have to be thoughtful. I think we're going to have to get creative um, and we have to spend the money, at least for our funds, that that's getting directly um, allocated to the state and to the counties by December 31st. So it has to be something that can be sustainable, that can, can take us past December 31st. Uh, because we can, you know, once that funding is gone, they're going to have to kind of figure it out without this federal fund. So, again, it has to be something that will last us through the long term. Uh, you know, I think those are really good insights, um, Troy. You know, I don't think people in the public understand, right, that there's over seven billion dollars in federal funding that's circulating right now. And we have a portion of it. But that other six billion dollars, we want to make sure that we are complementing any of the spending and not um, maybe wasting it and really, like you said, get it into the hands and in the pockets of the people who truly need that. Um, you know, I, I think um, to answer, um, to respond to Alan's question from my point of view, I think it's been really important over the last few weeks for us to vet all of these things because 
the guidance is changing constantly, as I think Linda is aware. Um, and we really, really want to put the money and get money to people in a way that makes sense and is expeditious um, and that they can spend it on the other thing that I think is really important in our community, right? If you get a child grant to be able to give it to someone who is working in our community means that that money is circulating in the community. And it's so important. Um, I'm going to pivot to another question because early child care was such an important issue um, as we headed into session. We had hoped to develop a stronger, more coordinated system. We had bills that were part of our majority package that would have provided universal access to quality early child care um, over time. So those plans, you know, you know, you guys know how disappointed I am. I know how disappointed you folks are. Those big plans have been sort of partially derailed because of the pandemic. But is there any pathway forward for improving um, Hawaii's early child care sector so that it could be stronger, more co more coordinated in this post-COVID world? I'll, I'll ask that question of uh, Representative Ichiyama first. I, yes, was disappointed um, that we had to po put a pause on a lot of our majority caucus package initiatives. And so unfortunately, the early learning bill was one of them, which would have provided, like you mentioned, universal access to early learning for all three and four year olds statewide. And we had to do a lot of groundwork and foundation building in order to make that happen. So I think some of that work can still continue, especially the coordination between the Executive Office on Early Learning and the Department of Human Services Office of Child Care Programs. What I would like us to see maybe you know, in the next few months and in returning next session continue to work on is data collection for the child care industry. Right. So when we've been looking at other states, for example, Colorado has a real time database and they can show which providers are open, which are closed, how many seats they have available, where are they located. And so it's a helpful temperature check of what's happening with the industry, for one. And then another is it, it can also be a resource for parents who are looking for care. Right. So even if right your provider in your area is not open right now, just write what are the services that they provide? Do they provide meals? Are they accredited? Is it family-based, group center-based? So having that kind of information and data collection, I think would be really helpful for us moving forward. Rep Hashimoto, you wanna um, uh, tackle some of that or any last comments on early childcare in Hawaii? This is gonna be our last question for you um, on the issue. Yeah. Absolutely. I think we can't stop with this issue. I think even though we have challenges, I think it'll allow us to be a little bit more creative in how we are moving forward, because I think online learning, whether we like it or not, is going to be a part of our future and how we you know, educate our future generations. And I think we're going to have to figure out how to integrate that. The other thing that we still are a long ways away from and we need to figure out how we're going to deal with it is how are we going to get all of these certified um, teachers and caregivers to in, into the, um, you know, the areas that we, we want to create. I think that was something that I was really thinking about um, as we as our bills were moving through and that's going to continually be a challenge. So we're going to have to make sure we ramp up on our, our college, the University of Hawaii system to make sure that they are ready to start recruiting and, and certifying these individuals so that they can, you know, make sure that we can uh, teach our, our, our youngsters um, when, when it's needed. And I think if that's one big thing we're going to have to make sure that we have in place, because that does take a while as well. Um, so lots to do. Um, of course, I, I don't feel like we should stop. And I think hopefully we can continue moving at ne next session and possibly even at part, partly this session. I'm, I'm hoping within the next couple of weeks we can come up with uh, something. So this is precisely why I love working with my colleagues. They really are thoughtful and they're thinking both about the immediate as well as the long-term needs. Thank you so much, uh, Linda and Troy, for joining me on this episode of Talk Story with House Majority. Want to welcome you back at some point um, uh, in the future. Um, and, and again, thank you for for joining us. I'm going to sign off now with my what I always say, it's more important than ever that we stay connected and informed during these uncertain times. If you're new to the show, please follow the House Majority on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at High House Dems for most recent updates and future episodes. You can also visit our website at hawaiihousedemocrats.com, which has resources, press releases, and valuable information on how the House Majority is responding to COVID-19. As we reconvene the legislative session next week, we will moving our we will be moving our program to Wednesdays at 8.30 a.m. Please stay safe, 
stay healthy and stay informed. We'll see you next Wednesday to talk story with House Majority. Aloha. Thank you.